Our first lesson comes from Romans, the 13th chapter. Owe no one, owe, owe, sorry. owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we come believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us lay aside the works of darkness and put the armor of light. Let us live honorably as the day, not revealing in drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires.
Our second lesson comes from Matthew, the 18th chapter. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be as to you a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I will tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it'll be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Join with me in prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. This past week, school began. The buses were running, schools hopefully were cleaned and ready, teachers had already been on the job preparing lessons, getting their rooms in order, and doing countless other tasks. School supplies were ready, and in some families, new clothes had been purchased for that first day of school. I remember those August days when my mother would take us shopping for school clothes. The task was not always to my pleasure. I hated shopping. And I hated shopping for clothes. And I hated shopping for school clothes. But it had its upsides, because you would start that first day of school with these new clothes on, and you'd be seeing other kids with new clothes on. And so it was a certain amount of excitement that it took away the sting of saying summer's over and school's back in session. But I did notice, and only perhaps really appreciated later on, that not all of us had new clothes. That there were some kids who still were wearing what they had worn, pretty much worn out last year. There were others who you could tell were wearing down things that had been passed to them, hand-me-downs from an older sibling or uh, some a gift from a relative or a friend. So we weren't all of us privileged to have something new that first day. In Paul's letter to the church at Rome, he writes about putting on something new. Paul says to the Romans, a new day is coming. The darkness of night is fading away. It's time to lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. We're to live honorably, Paul says, by putting aside things like reveling and drunkenness, debauchery and licentiousness, quarreling and jealousy. And in its place, we're to put on Jesus Christ, to live as he lived and to live as he called us to live. Paul's call of Jesus to a new way of living was written in the same chapter in Romans in which he counsels those new Christians in Rome to be good citizens of their community. He writes, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. He calls upon them to obey the laws and to respect those in authority, to pay taxes and to contribute to the well-being of the community. Now, these words are in context of what Paul and the Romans were experiencing, but, and they've been twisted over the years, as we know, by certain governments, abusive governments, dictatorial governments, uh, cruel governments. They've been used to help keep people in line. But in the larger context, they show that Paul was concerned that those in the community of faith 
be seen as assets and not liabilities to the community. That they should respect their governing leaders, I would add, when their leaders earn that respect through laws and policies and programs which contribute to the common good. This respect of those in authority was part of living an honorable life and being clothed in Christ. But of course, there's more to being clothed in Christ than just paying your taxes and being obeying the laws of the land. For Paul knew that the ruling class in Rome often lived pious lives during the day, but in evening, they sunk into excess, food in excess, drink in excess, sex in excess. This was not the way Christ's followers were to live. For new clothes mean new behavior. It's sort of like hearing your mother as you walk out of the door on that first day of school in your new clothes, who gives you pause by saying, now remember, don't get them dirty at recess. New behavior sometimes is hard. New behavior is challenging. Part of being human is the temptation to fall into certain behaviors and values and attitudes mostly shaped by the world. And those attitudes and values and behaviors become as comfortable as an old pair of jeans. And change, change becomes hard. And one of those things that becomes hard for us is to put aside our temptation to place judgment on others. We sometimes size each other up and make judgments based on appearance or speech or body language or skin color or ethnic makeup. And then we behave towards them according to that negative judgment. This is the foundation of all prejudice and all stereotyping. And it is a strong foundation that's hard to remove. But sometimes it takes a special event or a disaster to break patterns and habits. On Labor Day in 1998, we had a storm that rampaged through central New York. It caused damage in places like Port Byron where it destroyed the Federated Church of Port Byron. It touched the uh, New York State Fair where it did damage and killed two people. And it kept th swept through our neighborhood and brought down trees and damaged homes and ended power for a week. The storm lasted only a few minutes, but its effects were long lasting. But in the midst of the recovery from that storm, and we lost 19 trees on our property alone, there was an immense response of neighbors checking neighbors, food, being shared before it went bad, helping each other with little tasks, making sure that everyone had a place to, to go if they needed to go someplace. And acquaintances we barely knew came by and helped us cut up downed trees and limbs. And the village and the town responded by uh, calling away all that debris and, and helping the community to respond. In a, small way, <clears throat> in a small way, that experience in 1998 was just a, a little bit of a microcosm of what has taken place down in Texas. People helping people. People manning boats and coming to rescue people they now considered neighbors, giving no regard to race, skin color, citizenship, or political belief. In that moment, I think a lot of people had really put on Christ and were living out Christ's call to discipleship in an honorable way. But you know, it should not take a natural disaster to cause us to bring out new clothes in Christ. Those new clothes are the love and care we show to neighbors and each other. It's a love that Jesus and Paul says fulfills all the law. It makes the law complete. It makes those commandments real. It makes our lives holy, sacred, set apart. An honorable life in Christ is characterized by trust, openness, 
fairness, honesty, truthfulness, care, and love. Are there going to be disputes and conflicts even between honorable people? Sure. That's also part of life. But you know, Jesus in the passage that John read to us from Matthew shows us a way to deal with those conflicts. If we're sinned against, go first to that person that's offended us or hurt us and try and work it out. If that doesn't solve the problem, seek out help from a few individuals that they may help us find resolution. And if that doesn't work, seek out the community of the church, the community of faith. And if that doesn't work, walk away. Distance yourself from the one who has sinned against you and let it bother you no more. Now, this isn't a magical formula that works every time there's a conflict. But Jesus' way is characterized by the values of his teachings. Openness, fairness, truthfulness, care, and love. It's the way to live honorably, and it's the way by which Christ is indeed present in our communities, in our homes, in our lives. For wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them, Jesus said. May it be so for each of us, for our communities, and for our nation. Amen.